Well, hey there, everyone. I'm Daniel Hahn, and I'm the online campus pastor here at Oxford Assembly of God Church, and this is our podcast. And I just want to thank you for listening today. We hope the message you're about to hear inspires you, builds your faith, and helps you see that God has a purpose for your life. And now, let's get into the message. Recently, I was reminded that God is the God of all things. All things, that two-word phrase, all things, in the NIV is used 50 times. Different translations have a different number, but 50 times in NIV. In Chronicles, he's the ruler of all things. In Job, he can do all things. In Psalms, he's all things serve him, and he's a name above all things. And Jeremiah, he's a maker of all things. And Matthew, all things were committed to Jesus by the Father. Mark, he restores all things. And John, he teaches us all things and he knows all things. And Corinthians, he searches all things. And he says all things are his. Jesus Christ, through all, through who all things came. Then I like this one, grace may abound to us so that in all things we can have all we need. Ephesians bring all the things together as one. And all things grow up into him, all things. Colossians, all things were created by him. He was before all things and holds all things together. In Hebrews, he's the heir of all things. And he sustains all things. In 1 Peter, in all things Christ may be praised. And 1 John teaches us about all things. And you can research that verse or those verses, look up those words, and you'll find out something that all things means all things. All things. We have a God of all things. And I think probably, though, my favorite one is in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, begin reading at verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. How many glad that Spirit helps you in your weakness? For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. What's it saying? When you don't know how to pray, just pray in the Spirit, because he intercedes according to the will of God. And we know, verse 28, and we know that for those who love God, all things what? All things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. But it doesn't end there. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that we might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God... Before us, who can be against us? If God be for us, who can be against us? We can even say, if God be for us, what can be against us? Because he is God of what? All things. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. See, it started when he's praying for us and still interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, as it is written, for your sake, we are all being, we are being killed all the day long. We're regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. 
No. In all these things we are what? More than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. What precious promises. You could probably take time and number them off and name them off and you'd be amazed how many promises are in that specific uh, passage. He is Lord of all things. He is God of all things. What precious promises. And if he be for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, what can be against us? Now, I've known this before. But when I ran across it recently, it resonated in my spirit. Does that ever happen to you? You've you, you known something a long time and all of a sudden you read it again and say, Man, that, that's pretty rich. That's pretty rich. Well, in 1995, Dr. James Davis, who will be with us in, in March, Dr. James Davis read Stephen Covey's book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Now, that was in 1995. Point six impacted Dr. Davis tremendously. Now, what was point six for some of you that might have read that book? It was Synergize synergize. And some of you may be like me. See, I'm pretty good at Oxford English, but that's not Oxford, England. That's Oxford, Florida. And so synergize was above my pay grade. So I have to figure out what, what synergize mean. Well, the literal definition is to be coordinated the activity of two or more agents to procure a joint effect greater than the sum of their separate effects. Now, let me put that in Oxford English for the rest of us. That we are better together. We can do more together than we can do separate. That's what it's talking about. And when two get, and you say, well, boy, that's a, that's a pretty neat new idea. It's not a new idea. If you go over to the Old Testament, the book of Ecclesiastes, you'll see this in chapter four, where it says this. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil for if they fall one will lift up his fellow but woe to him is alone when he falls and is not another to lift him up now I was thinking this morning that whenever I went to Israel we were privileged to go to the Dead Sea now for those of you that haven't been to the Dead Sea it's so salty that you really can't sink in it and you walk out, and the further you, you walk, the deeper you get, the more buoyant you get. And all of a sudden, you can't, your feet won't touch the ground. And even a fat person like me, my feet wouldn't touch the ground. And I literally sat back in the water, and it was fun for a few minutes until I said, I can't get up. Because my feet wouldn't touch the ground. Fortunately, there was a, a rope out nearby, and you know, I didn't let anybody else know, but I made my way over to the rope so that I could help myself up. But if I didn't have that rope, I would have been by myself, and I'd been totally embarrassed because I'd had to yell for my wife, come get me. <laughs> we need each other. I said, we need each other. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and there's not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? For though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. So what does that mean? That means that, that two is better than one, but three is a lot better than two. The more we have, the stronger we get. We become stronger when we get together. So that point six, when it says we synergize, we are better together. Now, I told you that Dr. Davis read that book in 1995. Seven years later, in 2002, Dr. J. Davis and Bill, Dr. Bill Bright had been working together to launch 
the Synergize Conference. Synergize Conference. That was January after 9-11. Do you remember the fear that struck America after September of 9-11? It struck fear and people were afraid to travel. They were afraid to get together. And there was a fear rampant across the country. And numerous people in high places recommended that they cancel the Synergize Conference. And I love Dr. Bill Bright's response. I believe it was a classic response, and I believe it was a God-inspired response. He says, if we cancel it, how will we know what God wanted to do? If we cancel it, how will we know what God wants to do? Praise God. They did not cancel that meeting. And I was one of the original attendees in 2002. And I've been privileged to go to everyone since then, and I'll be attending this week. You say, well, what's the big deal? Well, at the first Synergize Conference in 2002, the goal was set to establish a global pastors network, a global church network, to plant 5 million churches in 10 years and to win 1 billion souls. Those goals were met in 7 years, not 10. Why? Because we found out that we're better together. We don't need to be fighting against the Baptists or the Church of God or the Church of the Nazarene. We're fighting against the devil. He's big enough to take all of our energy. We don't need to fight one another. We need to unite together and be synergized. Marcia and I and Amanda will be attending the 12th Synergized Conference this week, joining 800 leaders from over 50 nations. And I know some say, well, how does that fit in with this message? Well, I want to read Romans chapter 8, verse 28 again. Many of you can quote it in some variation. And we know that for those who love God, all things, now what does all things mean? All things. All things work together. Work together. Now, those of you that are Greek scholars, or some of you might not be like me. You don't know Greek. You just have to go to strong concordance. And you look, and look at that word, work together. Work together. And you know what the Greek word is? Synergo, where we get the word synergize. All things synergize together and work for good to those that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. I, that's amazed me whenever I read that and thought about God synergizes all things. See, there's no division in Christ. Let me say that again. There's no division in Christ. Now, we can have a difference of opinion. And I know a lot of people say, Pastor, on the upper room, they were all in total agreement. No. No. Matter of fact, I know that bunch. I know that I've had some of those people in my church. And some of the strongest members of that group, the, one of the last things we heard them arguing about was who was going to sit next to Jesus. That was the same group. And 120 of them, they were not in total agreement. The Bible says they were in one accord. What was that one accord? They were being obedient to Christ. Where he said, I want you to stay right here. Tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And then he will give you power to become witnesses. One of my favorite stories, uh, years ago I worked with the full gospel businessmen and uh, 
in uh, Lake Wales, uh, when I say I work with them, you have to be a, a businessman to be a member. I was a pastor, and of course, I was a bright age of about 25, so they, they knew they needed my wisdom to know how to operate. So they asked me to be their, their counselor, and so I met with them, and we, we were going to have a community-wide revival, community-wide revival, and it was a, after we had a Baptist preacher going to preach there. It was formulated very much like a Billy Graham crusade, except on a much, much smaller scale. And uh, I went to the president of the Full Gospel Businessman, a close friend of mine. I said, uh, we, need, we need the support of your church. I didn't ask about Full Gospel. I said, we need your church to be part of our area-wide revival. And he said, well, Daryl, you know that, and he named his, his denomination. He said, we're not evangelical. And I said, well, I thought you were spirit-filled. He said, I am. I said, what did you receive the spirit for? To be witnesses. He said, we'll be there. <laughs> we'll be there. Because God does not want us to be alone. He wants us to connect together and to center down. Now, but I want you to just think for a moment. When God says, I'm going to synergize everything that you've ever encountered, everything that you are encountering, everything that you will encounter, and I'm going to turn it into something good. Now, notice I did not say it would be good because Satan throws a lot of things at us that are not good. But God says, I'm able to work them all out for good. In two weeks, we're having our annual business meeting. And no, if you want to come, you do not have to be a member to attend our meeting. You will not be able to vote, but you're welcome to attend. And I can tell you that we'll be sharing some things that I'm amazed at. At what God has helped us. Now, let me rephrase that. What God has allowed us to help him do. Amen. See, so many times we say, God, help us. No, we need to help him. Because he's the supreme being. He's the one that can put it all together and make all things work together for good according to those who love the Lord. He is the synergizing force that enables us to say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He's the one that enables us to say, if God be for us, who can be against us? He's the one that tells us, what can separate me from the love of God? Not a thing in this world. It's through him all things work together for good. And again, I did not say they were all good because God causes some bad things to work together. Maybe the greatest example is recorded in the book of Genesis. Joseph was one of the few people in the Bible that he does not have anything hiding in his closet. Other than other than not being wise enough that he, he wanted to brag to his brothers that they were going to bow down to him. And I remind you what Brother Alton Garrison said, just because you're saved, you're made right, not bright. <laughs> you don't brag to ten older brothers, you're going to bow down worse than me. But I can tell you, most of us have done worse things than that. He was faithful. He was faithful. But he was sold by his brothers. How many thinks that's not good? He was lied about to his father. He was falsely accused. He was thrown into prison. And the one that resonates with me, I think more than anything, they forgot about him. They forgot about him. I think I promised, hey, listen, if you'll bail me out of this situation, if you'll help me out, I'll remember you. Have any of you ever had those, I'll remember you on payday. Yeah, which one? They forgot him. So I think you would have to say that 
he would probably tell us everything wasn't good. But notice what he said in Genesis chapter 45, verse 4. So Joseph came to, said to his brothers, come near to me, please. And they came near. And he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. He didn't candy coat it. You sold into Egypt. And now, do not be distressed or angry with yourselves. Don't be guilty. Don't feel guilty because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years. There's five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you for a remnant on earth and to keep alive for many, you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me a father to Pharaoh. Did you catch that? He made me a father. Now, he was underneath Pharaoh, but who was calling all the shots? Who was calling all the shots? This man that had been in prison. This man that had been forgotten about. This man that had been sold by his brothers. This man that somehow God had worked them all together for good. He's made me a father to Pharaoh and the Lord of all his house and a ruler over all the land of Egypt. So he told his brothers, don't feel guilty. Just relax, chill. It's good because God has worked all things. He synergized all things for good. But you know, they really didn't believe him. Because when their dad died, they got scared again. Now, I can kind of understand that. Because he, he held the power. He could have killed them like that. But notice what he said in chapter 50, verse 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Now, why did he weep? He said, fellas, I told you it was over. You'd already been forgiven. Now, I know some of you say, well, why would you say that? Because see, he had already had two sons. He had two sons. One of them was named Manasseh and one Ephraim. One of them says, you will be fruitful. But you know what the other one means? He has caused me to forget. Joseph was one of those that could literally say, I've forgiven it and I've forgotten it. And he says, so you don't need to carry that burden anymore. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to him, Do not fear, for I am I in the place of God. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. How awesome that is. And it very definitely proves that God works all things out for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Now we know that Joseph loved the Lord. Now his brothers, they weren't sure about that. They were unstable. But Joseph committed to God. He served him. And Joseph had enough faith to believe that everything that God had allowed to happen, I didn't say God caused it, but everything God worked for good because he loved him. Some of you today are carrying around guilt 
and baggage because you can't forgive yourself. If you've asked God to forgive you, it's already gotten forgotten. You don't need to carry it any longer. You don't need to carry it anymore. And you can say, listen, I've had some bad things happen to me. I've done some bad things. But my God is big enough that he's going to synergize it all together. He's going to work out everything, and it's going to turn out for good. How does that happen? I don't have a clue. But our God is bigger. Our God is powerful enough to do all things. All things. And I know one of the first things we ask ourselves, well, is that promise for everybody? And many times we say yes, but it's not. And we know that for those who love God. You know, I see a lot of people claiming God's promises that have never really submitted to God. One of the most things that I cringe at the most is when I go to a funeral service that to my knowledge they have never accepted Christ they've never acknowledged Christ and hear people say well they're better off really not really but for the believer even the believer Gator that's better for all things work together for good we're going to leave this body we're going to leave this earth, and we're going to heaven. Hallelujah. Can't get any better than that. Okay, this is worth the price of admission. You get this down, write it down. If you are not a believer, this is as close to heaven as you'll ever get. But if you are a believer, this is as close to hell as you'll ever get. Hey, but now that's, that's worth the price of admission. To know that God has worked things out in my life. Did I deserve it? No. But he knows I love God. And I've committed to him all those things. Now, I know a lot of you are a lot more mature than this. But, but I know I used to play a lot with dominoes. Dominoes was one of the games of choice. That and hind go seat about the only thing we could afford to play. But we played dominoes. And we had a lot of dominoes around our house, and I love to make trains out of them. Any of you ever do that? How many? I'm going to pull my glass off. We got one honest person. Anybody else do that? <laughs> Those of you that haven't done it, you missed it. What fun it is because you can make those trains do anything. If you learn how to place them just right, you can make them climb over a book. You can make them do all these things because you learn how to make them fall at the right place. Because you put them in order. I used to do that. Because I like to see what kind of path I can make them charge. Now, let me throw something out to you. God wants to play dominoes with you. He wants you to take everything that you have and put it in his hands and say, God, you make the train that you want it to be. Because when you do that, I don't have to worry about getting on the wrong track. I don't want have to worry about hitting a dead end. You know, that Long Ranger and Tonto, remember those? Some of you are old enough to remember Long Ranger and Tonto. They had Indians on right and their back behind them, and they come up to the Grand Canyon. And the Long Ranger said, boy, Tonto, what are we going to do? And he said, what do you mean we, pale face? <laughs> Sometimes we run into a dead end. But not if we've given our dominoes to God. Because we know... That all things work together. Good. And you so, say, well, what if Satan gives us his knockout punch? What if Satan's knockout punch says he kills us? God says, that's okay. I'm working out for good. Come on up and leave that old worn out body. Come out and leave all those problems. Leave your bills to the Antichrist. Come on up. Because God has the ability 
to work all things to the good. He just wants us to give him permission to put those dominoes where he wants them. So you will take the path that is for your good. And he's already doing it. I said he's already doing it. I look back at my life. And I'm reminded of the words of Steve Urkel. Any of you remember him? (laughs) Did I do that? Because I can tell you, Gator, I didn't do that. God did it. God did it. I will not go into detail because most of you have heard it. But simply, this, I'll tell you that the day I went to get my physical, to go into the Air Force, to be sworn in, and to come back home for two weeks, then go to Lachlan, I flopped my physical. I couldn't figure it out. I would prayed about it. I thought I knew what I wanted to do. I thought I was doing what God wanted me to do. But for one day, I had a hemorrhage of the kidney. No pain, no discomfort. Just my urine was as red as your shirt. And they said, you got to go to a kidney specialist. And they said, you had a hemorrhage of the kidney. And I wondered, well, God, why? Why? I'd quit my job. They'd already hired somebody to take my place. Of course, that went hard. But I dropped out of school. But I can tell you, looking back, God worked everything out. I was disappointed. I was a young 20, and I was healthy. And I knew some of my friends that couldn't walk and blow bubbles. And they said, yeah, we'll take you. And gave, they looked at me and said, you can't come in for nothing. Because God had a different plan. God was working those dominoes, and I didn't even know it. And then I looked back in my rearview mirror, and I said, God, look what you have done. Look what you have done. In just two or three weeks, we'll be celebrating our 39th anniversary here at Oxford. And I can tell you, when we sent a resume to Oxford, I didn't have a clue where Oxford was. And I was born in Florida. I sent one to Marathon. I sent one to Haines City. Why? Because I didn't know where God wanted me to be. And I could have been sitting at the beach today instead of a farming community. But God, I said, but God. Now, I hope you understand I'm not being frivolous because it's very serious. God is still working all things to good to those who love the Lord. And some of you are going through some struggles that you say, I don't understand it. I don't know what it is. But we need to understand just because God leads us into it doesn't mean that it's going to be stress-free. Doesn't mean that you're not going to have some bruises. Matter of fact, I can almost guarantee you, you're going to have some scars. But let me make this one point. Some of you have got some scabs and you're treating them like scars. A scab still needs to be worked on and still needs to be healed. A scar says, I've won. A scar says, I'm already through that. I've got my battle scar. So if you've got the scabs, turn those things over to God. And let him heal those, heal those scabs. And turn them into trophies for God. Because God is still working to do good for us. 
I close with this statement. If you have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit on your side, that's more than majority. We're truly more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Holy Father, we love you today. And God, I'm sure that we could go around this building and there'd be numerous stories that people say, oh, I didn't see it. I didn't know how God was working. But I know now that God was working things for good to those who loved God and are called according to his purpose. But Father, there's some folks here today that they need to let go and let you the giver of all things the synergizer of all things to to use those things in our life for good for good God have your way have your way today Why did God allow Joseph to go to Egypt? The scripture tells us, but sometimes we overlook it so that the remnant would be saved. If Joseph had not went to Egypt, there would be no nation of Israel today. I said there'd be no nation of Israel because Joseph's family of four and 66 others came. And because God had worked everything out in advance, we have the nation of Israel still today. But the greatest thing about the nation of Israel is not the nation of Israel. The greatest thing is that Jesus Christ was born so that you can have life. So let him work in your life today. Let him work in your life. On behalf of our pastor and staff here at OAG, we want to say thank you. Thank you for being a part of our ministry. We are grateful for you and the support you give our church and its ministries so that we can continue to do what God has called us to do, to be the family church for the family of God. For more content from Pastor Strickland and Oxford Assembly of God, check out our media website at oag.church/media.